Nach diesem Panel, nach unserem Panel Grenzen der Zukunft, stellen wir nun Mare Clausum, The Sea-Watch vs. Libyan Coast Guard Case von 2018 des britischen Forschungskollektivs Forensic Oceanography vor. Am 6. November 2017 wurden die Sea-Watch 3, der NRO Sea-Watch e.V. und die libysche Küstenwache für die Rettung eines Boots mit mehr als 130 MigrantInnen an Bord angefordert. Dieser äußerst konfliktreiche Vorfall im Mittelmeer vor der libyschen Küste, bei dem mindestens 20 Menschen starben, wird durch die Rekonstruktion von Forensic Oceanography rekonstruiert. Sie zeigt, welche Folgen die von Italien und der EU verfolgte Politik der Auslagerung von Grenzkontrollen haben kann. Diese Videorekonstruktion ist Teil des Mare Clausumsberichts von Forensic Oceanography, der als Grundlage für eine beim Europäischen Gerichtshof für Menschenrechte eingereichte Klage gegen Italien gedient hat. Mit dem Leiter des Projektteams von Forensic Oceanography, Charles Heller, haben wir das große Vergnügen, im Anschluss an dieses Screening sprechen zu dürfen. An der Stelle noch zwei Hinweise an unsere Community. Mare Clausum ist eine Videorekonstruktion, die Original-Footage der Überwachungskamera der Sea-Watch 3 verwendet und das Ertrinken von Menschen dokumentiert. Unserer Einschätzung nach ist dieses Video daher nicht für ZuschauerInnen unter 18 Jahren geeignet. Ich bitte Sie, das zu berücksichtigen. Mare Clausum ist außerdem ein Video in englischer Sprache, das nicht untertitelt ist. Mit anderen Worten, wir haben jetzt auch den Zeitpunkt erreicht, an der die Assembly auf Englisch fortgesetzt wird. Kommentieren Sie ruhig weiterhin in Deutsch und Englisch, schreiben Sie uns auch auf Deutsch oder Englisch verfasste E-Mails. Wir geben unser Bestes, Ihre Fragen und Kommentare in beide Richtungen zu übersetzen. Wir sehen uns also um 13 Uhr zum Artist Talk mit Charles Heller. See you all at 1 p.m. We head into the artist lecture and successive talk with Charles Heller and now Mare Clausum. In the night of the 5th to the 6th of November 2017, a rubber boat left Tripoli, carrying between 130 and 150 people. That night, the vessel of the rescue NGO Sea Watch was patrolling off the Libyan coast, just outside of Libya's contiguous zone, waiting for the next boat to rescue. At around three in the morning, the crew on duty saw the returns of two large ships on its radar screen. As these were not accounted for by AIS vessel tracking data, which most civilian ships are required to emit, the Sea Watch crew believed them to be military, either part of UNAFRAMED, the EU's anti smuggling operation, or of Italy's Marisi Kuro operation which has provided support to the Libyan Coast Guard and Navy in combating illicit traffic. Both these operations are part of a policy that aims to prevent migrants from crossing the sea by outsourcing border policing to Libya. As the migrants advanced, the sea became rougher and their boat began taking in water. The passengers contacted the Italian Coast Guard for help via satellite phone. At 5.53 and 6.01, Sea Watch received a distress signalization from the Italian Coast Guard, indicating no specific position, but that the vessel had departed from Tripoli. Sea Watch adapted its course immediately. The Italian Coast Guard also informed their Libyan counterparts, who had a vessel on patrol off the coast of Tripoli, and, according to a Libyan official we interviewed, requested their intervention. On the 10th of August 2017, the Libyan authorities had unilaterally declared the search and rescue zone, within which they claimed the responsibility to coordinate rescue, and repeatedly threatened NGOs entering it. 
Through the satellite phone provider, the Italian Coast Guard were soon able to determine the boat's location at 6 in the morning. The only geo-reference position we possess for the migrants' trajectory prior to rescue, and passed it on to Sea-Watch at 6.31. The Italian Coast Guard also warned Sea-Watch that the Libyan Coast Guard were present in a 9 nautical mile radius from the migrants' boat, and that Sea-Watch should proceed with caution. Sea-Watch's vessel is equipped with seven wide-angle cameras mounted on the mast and deck that are constantly recording. Two of these capture crucial video evidence for our investigation. Two additional GoPro cameras mounted on Sea-Watch's rigid hull inflatable boats, or RIBs, provide close-up perspectives. Triangulating visual data from these cameras, as well as from another located on the Libyan Coast Guard vessel, allowed us to generate a dynamic model of the scene. Navigating the model between different camera perspectives and cross-referencing this evidence with testimony and locational data allowed us to reconstruct the entire rescue operation and its dire consequences as they unfolded. As Sea-Watch approaches the position provided for the boat in distress, its crew sees other vessels through their binoculars. Apart from the silhouette of a French warship, these are, however, not yet visible in the lower-resolution video footage. At 8.24, Sea-Watch informs the Italian Coast Guard. Hello. Yes, good morning, sir. Uh, I'm just wanting to know that we are on, uh, close to the position of the, uh, of the yeah. refugee boat, but we can't see it. Um, there is a Libyan Coast Guard ship and a French army ship around, and an airplane, but we, uh, we have no visual on the, uh, on the boat. Okay, so sir, uh, I think that the, uh, the boat with the migrants is proceeding towards the north. Uh, so, uh, proceed towards the north to intercept the target. As Sea-Watch approaches, it can see the military aircraft circling back several times towards the migrant boat, now barely visible through Sea-Watch's binoculars. According to several survivor testimonies, it is around this time that the boat's back tube deflates and many passengers fall overboard. A little time, plane come, and we are shouting, but the plane go closer to us on the water. But it can't come down to come and rescue us. When he left the first time, and he came back for the second time. How much time? After how much time did he come back? Just for a while, he left, let me say, two minutes time when he left, before he come back. And we are, you know, when he come back, we are still on top of water, because the boat is still going, mama. When he left, when he's coming back for the third time, that he did not see us on water again. But he's seen people, little, little, our held, because we are inside the water already. Many people have died. That is how he threw a life jacket to us. At 8.45, the aircraft throws down life jackets and an inflatable raft, as well as smoke pots to mark the location of the boat in distress. There's a couple of flares, I think. I think this airplane is one further out, so there's a lot. Despite this, many of the migrants were unable to swim back to the deflated boat or to get a hold of the life-saving equipment while waiting to be rescued, and at least 20 people drowned. At 8.47, the French warship calls Sea-Watch via radio to offer its help. Sea-Watch 
seem to have a lot. Shortly afterwards, the French warship will contact the Libyan Coast Guard seven times offering support without receiving a reply. At 8.53, for the first time, the video footage shows distinctly and in the same frame all vessels in vicinity of the migrants' boat. As confirmed by a UNAF for Med internal report, they include the French warship L'Air, which will stay at a distance but later contribute one of its inflatable boats to the rescue, and the Portuguese patrol aircraft. Both these assets are part of the UNAF for Med anti-smuggling operation. We can further see the Libyan Coast Guard patrol vessel Ras Jadir, which had been handed over to them by the Italian interior minister on the 15th of May 2017. According to UNAF for Med's internal reports, eight out of the 13 crew members present on board had been trained by the EU operation. By projecting the image captured by Sea-Watch's video camera onto the sea's surface, we can estimate the relative distance of the assets from the Sea-Watch ship. We can then map their approximate position in a three-dimensional model of the scene. While at this time the Sea-Watch vessel is the closest to the rubber boat, within the next 10 minutes the faster Libyan Coast Guard vessel speeds up to intercept the boat first. The French warship continues to remain at a distance. While the Libyan Coast Guard informed their Italian counterparts that they would coordinate the rescue on scene, no instructions had been transmitted to Sea-Watch. Sea-Watch and the Libyan Coast Guard are left to resolve their conflicting imperatives of rescue and interception on their own as they approach. Original one six, go ahead. Despite the lack of confrontation in this communication, the logics of rescue and interception will prove irreconcilable. While the Libyan Coast Guard vessel circles around the migrant's boat, Sea-Watch sees people who had fallen overboard earlier still scattered in the water and left unattended. The rescue NGO lowers its two inflatable boats. Okay, guys, I stop and you prepare the towing the life off. Towing them off. Tow them off now. Without Sea Watch's intervention, many more people would have drowned.
At 9.07, an Italian military helicopter, deployed from a nearby warship, part of the Marisicuro operation, contacts Sea-Watch offering assistance and requesting that Sea-Watch send its rib near the migrant's boat. While the Libyan Coast Guard pull over the migrant's boat and begin taking people on board, Sea Watch ribs approach to rescue those in the water. Some of the intercepted migrants, fearing their treatment in the hands of the Libyan Coast Guard and in Libyan camps thereafter, attempt to reach the ribs of the European NGO instead. In this moment, the distance between Africa and Europe is only as far apart as that between the Libyan Coast Guard and the Sea Watch vessels. From the perspective of a mobile phone video shot by the Libyan Coast Guard, we can see that by pulling the migrant's boats towards its side, it risked making it capsize at any moment, thus endangering the passengers' lives. In an increasingly chaotic situation, with several people simultaneously in urgent need of help in the water, despite the best efforts of Sea Watch's crew, one person is left to drown.
While the Sea Watch crew is busy trying to rescue people, the Libyan Coast Guard starts throwing several hard objects at them. Thus, rather than prioritizing the rescue operation, they effectively hinder it. This aggression forces the Sea Watch ribs to retreat. As a result, a second person is left to drift and slowly die. We can see this person trying to escape the Libyan Coast Guard by attempting to swim towards the Sea Watch rib, just as it is forced to retreat. The Libyan Coast Guard, having not deployed its own rib, which a spokesperson later claimed was dysfunctional, is unable to assist him either. As the crew attempts to reach him, he is carried away by the currents. The video records the slow tragedy in its full graphic horror. We can see the man struggling to keep afloat and maintain his head above the water. But his body is slowly pulled down and he disappears under the waves into the sea's liquid mass. Now the Libyan Coast Guard appear to be signaling to the Sea Watch crew to return, but by the time the Sea Watch rib arrives, it is too late. At 9.30, almost all migrants have left the rubber boat. On the deck of the patrol vessel, the Libyan Coast Guard attempts to regain control over the captured passengers by cordoning them off with a rope and repeatedly beating them. Despite this, some migrants still attempt to escape. Come. You, you sit here. Close. Come. Sit there. Fast. Okay. 
At 9.36, the video shows the Libyan Coast Guard increase the boat's speeds to rapidly leave the scene. <laughs> Seizing his last chance, one more passenger desperately jumps overboard. The Libyan Coast Guard depart, despite him still hanging on the ladder on the side of the ship. Only after the Italian military helicopter repeatedly radios the Libyan Coast Guard vessel to stop, does the crew slow down and pull the person on board. The violence and carelessness exercised by the Libyan Coast Guard had become so excessive that even the Italian military, which has supported the Libyan Coast Guard's activities, had to try and contain it. Despite the interference by the Libyan Coast Guard during this conflictual rescue event, Sea-Watch succeeded in rescuing 59 people and brought them safely to Europe. However, as the Libyan Coast Guard faded into the distance with 47 intercepted migrants on board, their fate of detention and violence in Libya was clear to all actors involved in the events. Furthermore, over 20 people died before and during the rescue. By equipping, training, advising and coordinating the Libyan Coast Guard to enforce their policies of border policing by proxy, Italy and the EU shared the responsibility for the lethal outcomes of this and other interceptions at sea. While rescue NGOs such as Sea-Watch have been criminalized in Italy, their presence at sea remains fundamental to rescue migrants in distress as long as they are forced to embark on perilous journeys, but also to document and contest the EU's policies of containment.
So, welcome back to Zeppelin Museum's Online Assembly Beyond Borders. We've just seen Mare Clausum, the Sea-Watch vs. Libyan Coast Guard case 2018 by Forensic Oceanography, a video reconstruction of a highly confrontational event that took place on November 6, in 2017, in the Mediterranean Sea right off the coast of Tripoli in Libya. Of over 130 migrants on board a small boat, the NGO Sea-Watch managed to rescue 59 people who were brought to Italy, while 47 passengers were brought back to Libya by the Libyan Coast Guard, where several were subjected to grave violations of their human rights. At least 20 passengers died before and during the rescue. We have all just seen these tormenting images, and as I said in my introduction, this documentation built the ground for a legal complaint submitted to the European Human Rights Court. We are delighted to be able to welcome Charles Heller, a research fellow with Forensic Oceanography, who headed the production team on the Marum Clausum video. Let me introduce our guest. Charles Heller is a researcher and filmmaker whose work has a long-standing focus on the politics of migration. In 2015, he completed a PhD in research architecture at Goldsmith University London, where he continues to be affiliated as a research fellow. He's currently based in Geneva, or as we just learned in Neuchâtel, conducting a postdoctoral research supported by the Swiss National Fund. He has partaken in several investigations as well as exhibitions with forensic architecture, among them being The Left to Die Boat, 2012, and Death by Rescue, The Lethal Effects of Non-Assistance at Sea, 2016, as well as the first major survey exhibition of the research collective, um, under the title Counter Investigations at the ICA, the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London in 2018. This exhibition, by the way, brought forensic architecture the nomination for the prestigious Turner Prize the same year. So, welcome, Charles. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you, Ina, as well, and the whole uh, technical team in, in the background. You're most welcome. Um, just one quick before one quick mentioning before mm -hmm. we um, start your lecture. I'm equally delighted to welcome Ina Nedermeyer, my colleague and curator of the exhibition Beyond States. Hi, Ina. We've seen you yesterday evening already. Welcome back. And um, Charles will now for the online community. Um, Charles will now give us further insights to the work of forensic oceanography, and afterwards we will have the opportunity to talk. So now for the next half hour. Dear Charles, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique and Ina, and I look forward to, to continuing the conversation together um, after. Um, you just described, Dominique, these images as tormenting images, and I think this is a really perfectly apt uh, description. These images, you know, are uh, shocking. They should shock us. They should um, torment us. And it is our hope that this reconstruction based on the footage um, generated by, by Sea-Watch and it's um, the different cameras that it had on board that I'll, I'll mention in a, in a few minutes. It is very much my hope that this footage torments as well um, you policymakers and, and states, state agencies. Um, it's of course maybe difficult even to speak after um, such, a, such a site. Um, what I'd like to try and offer here, um, also as part of this ongoing series of, of discussions on the transformations of um, state spaces, citizenship, and state authority, um, I'd like to try and locate this video and, and this incident within the broader trajectory of research and projects led by Forensic Oceanography, uh, an independent but affiliated project uh, connected, if you will, to the Forensic Architecture uh, Agency, but also locate this incident within the shifting policies and bordering practices at the, the maritime frontier. So if you will, I'd like to take a step back um, from the video itself before coming back to it in, in the later part of, um, of my presentation. So let me just share my screen with you and share a few slides um, as, I, as I talk.
So forensic oceanography as a project emerged nearly 10 years ago as a result of two entangled processes, if you will, both of which somehow opened different horizons of possibilities, in very um, different ways, of course. The first is the progressive emergence of the forensic architecture project based at uh, Goldsmiths. And starting here from this image um, of Richard Goldstone, the UN rapporteur, who conducted a mission, an investigation on the 2008-2009 Operation Cast Lead, um, led by the Israeli military against the Gaza Strip. And in this um, military intervention, the majority of the more than 1,400 civilians who died, died as a result of their own homes collapsing onto their bodies. And so you see here the rubble of buildings in, in Gaza. And this is fitting because um, on the one hand of the way architecture had been used in this instance as a weapon of war, but also of the particular role that architecture um, played in Richard Goldstone's reports. In a way, we could see from this report that once architecture was used as a weapon of war, it could also be reverse engineered, so to speak, and brought to bear witness as to how it was made to kill and to what extent um, these uh, different lethal attacks um, were, were lawless or on the contrary, uh, or, or, or represented violations of, of international law. And this was a fundamental moment in the emergence of the forensic architecture um, project. It seemed to epitomize the way um, a range of different evidence and technologies to reconstruct uh, and produce that evidence were being increasingly used within the field of human rights. What um, A.L. Weitzman, Tom Keenan, Susan Shupley um, in, uh, identified as the forensic turn in human rights. And essentially, um, forensic architecture emerged uh, as, how should I say, a way to experiment with this turn, reflect upon it, not by um, looking at it from a distance, but actually trying it out, intervening within this turn, pushing it further in some um, respects. So in a way, forensic architecture uses the forensic perspectives, which seeks to um, register through scientific methods, traces of violent events, but uses the broad range of 21st century digital traces and brings a spatial edge to um, reconstructions looks beyond the limited language of the law to document forms of violence that are not always easily accounted, accountable um, within the, the language of the law and its very limited cases, if you will, and also seeks to go beyond the limited forums of the law, even as, as we do use, of course, um, different court rooms in front of national and international jurisdictions to um, present our, our work. Now, this was um, the context in which we located our research at the time. Um, and I want to mention a second rupture that uh, very much shaped our work. And this was um, the Arab uprisings, which occurred precisely 10 years ago, um, this, this January. And these uprisings, which, would, which began in Tunisia and quickly spread to the rest of North Africa and the Middle East um, also entailed because uh, they, they brought down authoritarian regimes such as the Ben Ali uh, regime, which had served as the pillars of the EU's policies of border externalization. These uprisings also led to the reopening of the Mediterranean frontier. You see here a slide with uh, the trajectory of Tunisian migrants who, who escaped and seized their freedom to move from, um, uh, by crossing the Mediterranean frontier just after the toppling of the, Meta, the Ben Ali regime. At the time, they described this as seizing another dimension of the freedom that the Ben Ali regime 
had uh, denied them. At the same time, however, the repressed uprising in uh, Libya was leading to a far greater displacement of population uh, living in Libya at the time, to neighbor, mostly to neighboring countries, in a way that was far um, less liberatory. The crossings of the sea in particular were occurring in very precarious circumstances. Um, and there were at, at the time, by June um, 2011, already 1,500 deaths that were recorded in the central Mediterranean only for that year. And these deaths were occurring, however, in a very particular context, the context of um, NATO's military intervention uh, against the Gaddafi regime with the stated aim of preventing the loss of civilian lives. However, it appeared clearly that once those lives were escaping through the sea, preventing their deaths was far from the priority of the, of the NATO forces that were deployed off the coast of Libya. And in fact, there were growing um, indications and accounts of um, military actors deployed at sea failing to assist migrants crossing that area. And so a small NGO based in France, the Gisti, specializing in strategic litigation, announced that it would file a complaint against NATO, the EU, and all states taking part in the coalition in Libya, arguing that as a result of the unprecedented decree of surveillance means deployed off the coast of Libya, they could not not be aware of the distress of migrants crossing this area, and as a result, were guilty of the crime of non-assistance. And essentially, you can see here how these two developments come together. Uh, seeing this press statement, and with the horizon of possible practices that forensic architecture had uh, generated for, for us, we simply contacted the Gisti and the soon coalition of organizations around it to try and support their work through um, emerging forensic techniques within our, our project. And that is how, in fact, we formed forensic oceanography um, nearly 10 years uh, ago. Soon, the coalition uh, decided to focus on what is known as the Left to Die Boat case, an incident in which 72 passengers left the coast of Libya in March 2011. And despite repeated contacts with different states and also military actors, they were abandoned to drift for 14 days in NATO's maritime surveillance area, and only nine people um, survived. And so this is the, the, the first incident that we began to investigate in uh, summer 2011. Now let me try and stress here how challenging this was at the time. Needless to say, the death of migrants at sea are not a new phenomenon. Um, these deaths are structural to um, the European border regime, which since the early 90s uh, has increasingly denied the right to access EU territory and safe means of transport to citizens from uh, the global south. And as these contested their spatial assignation, their denial um, of their freedom to move, they were forced to resort to clandestine strategies of migration, which precaritized their mobility. And this has led, in fact, to more than 40,000 documented deaths at the maritime frontiers since um, the early 90s. But at the time when we began our investigations, in fact, what civil society could do in relation to those deaths was essentially count them, denounce them as the outcome of the EU's policies. But it was very, very difficult to document the way the practices that led to those deaths and breach the impunity that prevailed for them. And so it is that impunity that we sought to challenge by undertaking this first investigation on the left to die boat case. And in doing this, I think there were two important methodological moves that we um, had to, to operate. The first one was essentially um, seizing upon some of the surveillance means deployed by states to police the maritime frontier and kind of um, use them against the grain to uh, shed light on acts of border violence instead. The second move was to 
um, spatialize the traces of border violence that we would document within the political geography of the maritime frontier. In fact, we, we often think of the maritime space as a kind of lawless space that lies beyond the reach and jurisdiction of states. In fact, maritime spaces are saturated by crisscrossing and overlapping and conflicting jurisdictions, as you can see here from a map of different jurisdictions in uh, the, the Mediterranean. In particular, you see here indicated in red what are known as search and rescue areas, the areas within which coastal states are responsible for um, coordinating rescue activities. But as you see, they overlap. Some states, such as Italy and Malta, have signed different versions of maritime conventions. And so this particular legal and jurisdictional structure of the, of the sea, in which no state exercises complete sovereignty, and all states share degrees, if you will, of sovereignty, this particular structure allows states both to expand their rights to intercept migrants and in, uh, implement bordering practices on the high seas, but also to retract from their obligations and refrain from rescue, um, from rescuing um, migrants. So these two steps, um, you, seizing upon the various forms of remote sensing technologies, and on the other hand, understanding and inscribing these traces within the political geography of uh, the sea would be absolutely central to our um, project. And with these methodological tools, if you will, in, um, in mind, we embarked on documenting this incident. First, um, interviewing survivors, but also using the single image of this entire event that, that was available at the time, a photograph taken by a French surveillance aircraft, which was sent to the Italian Coast Guard along with the coordinates of the vessel um, uh, at, at the time. We also had um, several distress signals which contained geo-reference coordinates um, containing specific moments in time and space in which the boat was known to be located and which informed all vessels in the area of the distress and location of the passengers. With this information, we determined the moment of drift of the passengers, the moment when they ran out of fuel, and we called upon an oceanographer to reconstruct the deadly drift based on wind and current uh, data. The question then became, where were the 38 warships deployed off the Libyan coast at the time, which all, all of them failed to bring themselves to assist um, the drifting passengers and avert their tragic fate? To try and answer this question, we use satellite imagery, uh, which you see here, which is only 75 meter resolution and thus only indicates the presence of large vessels in the area, several of which, which must have been military. And you can see that there were several vessels very close to the position of the drifting boat at the time, indicated in yellow, several of one, which were only some two hours away from the drifting boat and could have rescued the passengers um, quite easily. On the basis of all these elements, we reconstructed in detail um, the chain of events for this, the entire um, 15 days of this boat's trajectory and the practices of actors that led to this form of violence that operates without touching what we've called liquid violence. And this investigation was the basis for several cases in front of French, Italian, Belgium, and Spanish um, courts against the states taking part in the, the intervention. Several cases, some of the cases which are still in ongoing and um, the, the coalition see, hopes to bring this case in front of the European Court of Human Rights uh, once they have exhausted the means of um, domestic remedy as they are um, called. So in this way, forensic oceanography opened a small breach in the invisibilization of migrants' deaths at sea and the impunity for those deaths that had prevailed until then. And this small crack, if you will, was opened further by other um, activists' initiatives, some of which we participated in, such as the Watch the Med 
platform, which we contributed to, to initiate in 2013, and the Watch the Med Alarm Phone that emerged as of 2014, which we also contributed to um, set up. But these different tools, which were, which did and still do offer crucial um, means of pressure uh, against states and support to migrants at sea, nevertheless still left into the hands of states the monopoly, if you will, over actual interventions at sea. And that monopoly, however, would be challenged after the lethal and criminal ending of the Mare Nostrum operation um, uh, that had been led by Italy and the attempt of rescue NGOs to fill that lethal rescue gap um, uh, left by states. I won't describe in too much detail um, the ending of the Mare Nostrum operation, which we've also reconstructed in our Deaths by Rescue um, report. But essentially that operation, um, which had proactively rescued migrants in uh, distress between 2013 and 2014, was soon um, described as constituting a pull factor by European states and the EU refused to Europeanize, if you will, this, um, this Italian operation. Instead, the EU proposed a much more limited and border control oriented Frontex operation, despite um, several calls by uh, human rights organization, the, the, the human, uh, the, the office of the human, oh, excuse me, um, the UNHCR, but even from Frontex itself that um, uh, foretold that the ending of this operation would not lead to less crossings, but only more migrants deaths at sea. And effectively, this is what we show um, happened in our, in our report, um, where both the number of deaths, but also the danger of crossing the sea calculated through the migrant mortality rate um, increased exponentially following this lethal policy of retreats. And so as the EU in April 2015 um, uh, still refused to reestablish uh, a proactive rescue um, operation, it came into the hands of uh, European civil society, humanitarian organizations such as, such as MSF, but also many smaller organizations at the time, such as Sea Watch and, and others, to try and make up for the lethal rescue gap that states had left in the wake of this operation. Now, 2015 also coincided with um, what we call the long summer of mig migration. It's essentially the peak in migrants' capacity to overcome European borders. And that capacity proved deeply destabilizing for European um, states and the EU as a whole. And so um, 2015 is also kind of a tipping point, the moment where really EU, the EU institutions and member states decide to seal off the Mediterranean frontier at all and any cost. First, by reestablishing border control throughout the Balkans, but then by outsourcing border controls once again um, to non-European uh, states, starting from the Aegean with the EU-Turkey deal, and then once the Aegean had been near, nearly sealed off at the time, the attention returned to the central Mediterranean where um, migrants' crossings had increased um, once again. And here, essentially, Italy and the EU deployed a two-pronged policy, which we have called Mare Clausum, involving, on the one hand, the criminalization of uh, rescue NGOs, and on the other hand, the outsourcing of border control to the Libyan Coast Guard um, once again. I'll go extremely briefly um, uh, in describing these two uh, policies, which we describe at length in um, our Mare Clausum uh, report. Um, concerning the first, the criminalization of rescue NGOs, we began uh, trying to oppose this trend first by our report blaming the rescuers, which um, empirically contested the so-called pull factor um, argument. But soon as rescue NGOs were also criminalized uh, via accusations of collusion with smugglers, in particular um, the Juventa vessel of the Jugendrettet uh, organizations, we also offered um, rescue NGOs our support with 
counter investigations of um, the, the, the events for which they, they were accused of collusion. For example, here, Jürgen Retzet was accused of pulling a boat, this boat that you see here, back towards the Libyan coast um, for reuse by Libyan smugglers. And in fact, our reconstruction shows that it was pulling the boat away from the Libyan coast and that the team of Jürgen Retzet only abandoned that boat because on that morning, um, it had to go as quickly as possible to the rescue of the fifth boat in distress on that single morning, right? This was not at all an act of collusion, but in fact, it was obliged to, forced to abandon that boat um, to operate in the most effective way its task of rescue at sea. And it just so, so happens that the boat was um, recuperated by um, engine fishers and smugglers in, in Libya, but in no way demonstrates the collusion of the NGO with smugglers. Despite this, the Jugendrettet vessel, the Juventa, remains seized and its crew under investigation to um, this day. On the other hand, the EU stepped up its collaboration with the Libyan Coast Guard, which is described in more detail in the Barry Clausum um, video that you've just seen. But I think what's really fundamental to see here is that the, the shape that this um, collaboration took was also a response to um, the limitations imposed on this practice that you see here with, um, in fact, uh, an illegalized migrants who had been intercepted by the Italian border police being brought back by on, on an Italian vessel to uh, Tripoli port in 2009. And this practice was deemed illegal by the European Court of Human Rights in 2012 where it considered that because the migrant had come aboard an Italian ship, Italy had been responsible for breaching its obligation of non refoulement. Now, that means that when Italy and the EU seek to reestablish their collaboration with the Libyan Coast Guard, what they do essentially is almost take this judgment as a manual to guide their, their new practice, which, which consists in a form of refoulement by proxy, in which they equip, coordinate, um, train, um, um, support in multiple and direct in multiple ways the Libyan Coast Guard, so, so that EU states and actors never actually touch the migrants, the bodies of migrants, and enable the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept and pull them back to Libya instead. And you really see the way these two um, dimensions of the Mari Clausum um, operation are deeply intertwined in the sense that if the EU wants um, the Libyan Coast Guard to effectively intercept and pull back migrants to Libya, those same migrants cannot be um, rescued and brought to Libya by the Sea Watch vessel, a conflict that you see uh, at work in the Mari Clausum operation. But likewise, if the EU wants um, the Libyan Coast Guards to be able to violently intercept migrants in, with impunity, rescue NGOs uh, cannot be, be present to document those violations as well. So uh, the outsourcing of border control also has an aesthetic dimension to it, which means um, keeping the violence of borders out of sight of European civil society. And as you see, from uh, the Sea Watch incident. This is precisely what Sea Watch sought to contest. In um, autumn 2017, the Sea Watch further equipped its vessels with several cameras that would allow it to document incidents for which it might be accused of, of collusion with smugglers and document with greater precision the violence of the Libyan um, Coast Guard. And this material was absolutely essential to document with um, an unprecedented degree of precision one such violent interception per perpetrated by um, the, the, the Libyan um, Coast Guard. Now, let me say here that as important as this footage has been, and again, it has been presented as evidence to the European Court um, in, in addition to a longer written report and a complaint um, uh, filed by Glenn and, and other uh, legal actors. At the same time, um, this footage did really, um, how should I say, generate some 
uh, important ethical challenges for us. On the one hand, the footage, contrary to um, the reconstruction that I shared of the left of the left to die boat case, which operated at the scale of the entire Mediterranean, right? Uh, here we are um, extremely close to the events. In fact, rubbing against the bodies of migrants fighting for survival. There are also, as you have seen, um, images of people who are, who actually drowned during this incident. And of course, we will never be, although all of the, the survivors that we have spoken to um, did want these images to be shown and did want to seek justice for the violence that was done onto them. Needless to say, we will never be able to request the consent um, of those who died and whose image is um, in, in the video um, recorded. So this footage, as important as it, as it is, raises also very important um, ethical um, challenges, which maybe we'll have a chance to discuss further um, later on. Just um, one of the strategies that we've used, for example, in, in uh, artistic displays recently, is to also accompany this video with um, a, an extensive uh, video recording of the testimony of one of the passengers who is also looking back at this footage and somehow um, re-subjectifying uh, it, if you will. So that was my attempt, very brief here, to kind of locate um, the Mare Clausum video, both within the trajectory of projects conducted by forensic oceanography, but also within the shifting bordering practices and policies implemented by um, the EU and its member states to um, uh, seal off the Mediterranean frontier. And I would say, you know, just in closing, that while um, documenting and litigating against border violence, while intervening against, um, to prevent these forms of border violence as search and rescue NGOs or the alarm phone are doing, is absolutely um, essential. We should also realize that border violence will um, continue to be perpetuated in changing and ever-changing forms as long as the root causes, not of migration understood as a problem, but rather the root causes of the mobility conflict um, located in inequality between the global north and the global south, but also a, a continuing and unaddressed European racism perpetuates itself and leads to this structural crash, the clash between restrictive European policies and um, the, the, the quest for freedom and equality of migrants from the global south. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll leave it there for, for now and look forward to um, the conversation with all of you. Well, thank you so very much, Charles, for these valuable insights. Um, as expected, um, we did receive some questions from the community and I'd like to, to dive directly into the Q&A session by um, asking something on the so-called pull effect. Could you elaborate on the so-called pull effect and how you managed to disprove it? Sure. Sorry, let me just grab a sip of water. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to, um, to summarize, you know, in, in 30 seconds here, um, you, you could, I, I would suggest that you, if this is a question that interests you, please have a look at our Blaming the Rescuers report. Also, there is further research that, is, that has been co conducted since then and that really confirms um, our conclusions. But I think there are, there are two core arguments. Um, the first argument is simply, for example, that's pull factor uh, criticism was also leveled against Mare Nostrum. And in fact, what we show in our report is that increasing crossings had begun before Mare Nostrum had been deployed. And in fact, Mare Nostrum responded to those increasing crossings and deaths at sea, right? Not, uh, not, was not the cause of that increase. Furthermore, the ending of Mare Nostrum did not lead, as I just mentioned very briefly, did not lead to a deterrent or the ending of those crossings, but in fact, the crossings, the number of crossings continued unabated uh, at the same level as before, and only the number of deaths increased uh, exponentially. So um, in relation to search and rescue NGOs, I think that's already a precedent that demonstrates the fallacy of that pull factor um, argument. In relation to rescue NGOs, we, we've shown that 
essentially um, the cause of increasing crossings was rather located in other factors, um, let's say on the African continent of growing political economic crisis, mm -hmm. of also of the worsening situation in, um, in Libya, which factors that were uh, converging, if you will, in leading to more crossings, uh, but that were not, um, th that were not, let's, in which the presence of rescue NGOs was by far not the main factor. And in fact, one of the, the main and easiest arguments to, to prove that is simply that um, a comparable increase in crossings was observed as well in the Western Mediterranean, i.e. between Morocco and Spain, in absence of any um, rescue NGOs whatsoever, right? So, um, I mean, I'm just taking here two examples that we use in our Blaming the Rescuers reports. Uh, the bottom line is that this accusation simply doesn't hold um, the confrontation to empirical analysis. Instead, um, something that has never been, you know, brought up by Frontex and other um, policymakers is that, in fact, um, the presence of rescue NGOs is strongly correlated with a decreasing danger for migrants crossing the sea, right? And this is a strong statistical <laughs> correlation that you can, that you can verify um, as well. I am absolutely sure that Ina is going to address Frontex uh, later in our talk. And I would like to ask a question. Well, I think I should rephrase it because I was, I was um, trying to, um, planning to ask you about what we just saw could be described as state failure. And I think that you made already quite clear. And I'd like to rephrase the question and, um, and ask you whether you could elaborate or maybe estimate the effect um, that forensic oceanography's work has on political processes and more precisely on political decision making? That's of course a, a, very, a very challenging one. And I would say, you know, uh, the, if effects always needs to, to be analyzed, how should I say, in, in multi-directional ways and different temporalities. Um, I would also want to stress that forensic oceanography is just one actor among uh, many others were participating in a, in a collective effort to uh, document and contest um, the violence of borders. And our modest contribution is to document violations and to support um, litigation against them in a way that seeks to um, increase the cost, if you will, of those policies for states, right? In fact, um, only yesterday, the UN Human Rights Committee um, has judged that Italy failed in its obligation to uh, perform rescue in another case that we um, have contributed to documents from, from 2013. So I think it's a modest contribution um, and we should, yeah, really, how should I say, I think it's, it is both absolutely necessary, but at the same time, it's also uh, modest, if you will. Um, in thinking about human rights practice, I'm inspired by the work of Samuel Moyne and his book called Not Enough. Um, you can hear that as a critique of human rights, but in fact, I think this is very liberatory. Human rights is true are not enough. They, they can't uh, in and of themselves end the forms of violence, of inequality that structure our world. But not enough does not mean useless. Um, and we, we should use them tactically as tools to forward demands for justice, freedom, and, and equality. Uh, yeah, and you mentioned Frontex, and of course this is also quite interesting. And If we are talking about the violence of borders, we should also talk about the role of Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. And I would like to ask you, what is your opinion on Frontex and their involvement um, in the refugee crisis um, and especially concerning or taking into consideration the recent developments there might be involvement into illegal pushbacks? Thanks, Sina. I mean, Frontex, that's, it almost feels like we would need a whole a uh, discussion dedicated only to, to Frontex. But let me say uh, three or four things. One, um, Frontex really 
constructs, it plays a key role in constructing migration as a risk, as opposed to um, our understanding of uh, migrants being put at risk through the EU's bordering um, policies. Border control operations lead to more risks for migrants at sea. And in fact, you could really draw kind of a, uh, an overall trend where actually the more migrants die at sea, the more uh, the budget of Frontex increases because the EU continues to focus on security oriented approaches to deal um, with, with migrants. Frontex also, for example, in fact, played a major role in uh, the veritable campaign against search and rescue activities, both in relation to Mare Nostrum um, and in relation to rescue NGOs. I mean, Frontex in that sense is really marked by an anti-search and rescue ideology, um, regardless of which actor is effectively um, operating it. And Frontex was also played a key role in this policy of retreat uh, that we've seen since um, 2000. 14, 2015, and effectively, there are very, very, very few um, rescue operations conducted by Frontex and as well by other EU state actors at this point, where really Frontex and other EU state actors have kind of retreated physically from the coast of Libya and rather use various surveillance means, including um, aircrafts to detect migrants' boats in advance and um, uh, coordinate the activities of the Libyan Coast Guard so that they pull them back towards um, Libya. So um, the practices, policies, and discourse of Frontex is, you know, highly should be crit critiqued in the strongest terms on uh, a number of levels. And over the last year, Frontex has come under increasing attack, uh, attack both for its um, role in the Balkans, but also in particular now um, in the, the Aegean Sea, uh, where it is accused of being complicit with uh, the practices of pushback perpetrated by the, the Greek um, Coast Guard. So this is, I would say, a welcome pressure that we're seeing um, right, right now. Let's see how far it is able to go. Um, the very legal structure of Frontex to date has really allowed it to evade most demands for uh, accountability and I very much hope that uh, this trend will be um, reverted somehow by, by the common, current uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have reconstructed a number of violations of migrants' rights at sea over the last 10 years. And I want to ask you, as you have been invited as an expert, for instance, um, um, for the German Bundestag, um, how has the work of forensic architecture, forensic oceanography um, has changed um, the work and um, how they, had it changed like countering border violence and like getting a new perspective into the discussion? It, it is my hope that the work that we have done um, has contributed to uh, make the violence of borders something that is inescapable, something that people cannot say we, we do not know. We do not know what happens. We do not know how it happens. We do not know who is responsible. Um, and that said, I think, you know, since we began our project 10 years ago, many more actors have sought to intervene at sea. I'm, I'm thinking once again of the Watch the Met Alarm phone, of rescue uh, NGOs, and their work too today really contributes to uh, intervening and um, seeking accountability for the violence of borders. So I, I would really stress that our contribution is only once amongst um, others uh, at sea. And that is also why today um, we are initiating, in fact, a new project called Border Forensics, um, which will expand from um, the EU's maritime frontier and um, seek to address as well other border zones such as the Sahara or the Alps or the Balkans, which have been much less documented to, de to date and in which um, the, the level of impunity, let's say, is, is much uh, higher. 
Yeah, and um, one question that um, might also consider recent developments. How has the pandemic changed the migration in the Mediterranean Sea? Has it worsened? And what is the role of civil sea rescue at the moment? So the pandemic is, uh, and, and its relation to migration and borders is something that um, I've been uh, writing about as well. Um, recently in a more academic context, let's say. I would say that essentially um, we, we've really seen a kind of conflation uh, by states of uh, the war on migrants that they've been waging for years and the war on the virus, right, that, uh, they, they've, that they've waged uh, against this pandemic. Let me be very clear. Um, the I take the the, the COVID-19 pandemic very, very uh, seriously and its effects um, as well. But very simply put, the conflation of uh, the pandemic and of irregular migrants that we've seen in many different contexts, in Italy, in Hungary, in Greece, to name only a few um, specific contexts, is once again absolutely not uh, supported by factual analysis. I think we, we all know that if the, the virus spreads so quickly across the globe, it is rather as a, as a result of the movement of privileged travelers jetting across different transport uh, hubs and not as a result of the precaritized movements of, of migrants. Regardless of that, we really have seen this conflation. And essentially, um, where this this, this two-dimensional war, the war on migrants and the war on the virus have overlapped, we've really seen heightened border violence, the stripping of rights um, in, in very, very clear ways. We've seen this in, in the Aegean, we've seen this in the central Mediterranean, we've seen this in um, other, other areas. Um, in my own view, in fact, uh, the pandemic should not at all lead to increased violence uh, uh, against, against migrants, which is entirely counterproductive. Uh, in fact, it should rather lead us to implement policies founded on their freedom to move already now in the present. Now, this might seem uh, counterintuitive at, uh, at the first, um, at, at, at the first uh, appearance uh, to call for freedom of movement at the time when uh, states are rather restricting their borders, not only for migrants, but for other EU nationals as well. The truth is that I think that we should, in the measure of, of our capacity, limit our mobility to, to prevent the spread of the virus. I'm entirely for this. I have not moved from uh, my small city in, uh, in, the, in the last months. But the fact is that many precaritized, precaritized migrants do not have the luxury of staying at home. They will cross borders no, no matter what. And as long as they do not have safe and legal means um, to cross borders, not only um, are their own lives put at greater risk, but also they have far less capacity to protect themselves and others from, um, from the virus. And in fact, granting freedom of movement is the condition to also support migrants in, in protecting themselves and protecting others against uh, the virus, a capacity that states entirely lose if migrants uh, are, are forced to um, move through uh, clandestine strategies. I'd like to maybe change the perspective a bit on the Maro Clausum and the forensic oceanography work in general, because I do, maybe, maybe you're already tired of this question, but I do remember vivid discussions about forensic architecture's uh, work uh, being exhibited, being showed in an art context, right? Most vividly actually in the context of Documenta 14. And now Mare Clausum is also being exhibited in an art context, which is our exhibition Beyond States. Um, so in your opinion, what's the difference of screening such a video in let's say a museum and an art exhibition and a conference on human rights, for example? Well, let me say that, first of all, that our work really um, emerges from and circulates within um, three main fields, right? Um, the field of non-governmental politics, human rights, the field of research, academia, and uh, the field of art. And really, for me, all those three fields are absolutely central 
to my work, to the way I think, the way I, I, I work, but also to, let's say, to the circulation of our work. And I think what's really interesting for me is that in each of these contexts, our work generates different discussions, different questions, right? So, for example, in the context of art, um, also in the presentation of our work, will often be foregrounding um, rather aesthetic questions, aesthetic not understood in questions of beauty or ugliness, but the politics of what is uh, visible and invisible, audible and inaudible, or inaudible right? Um, questions that do not really get addressed in uh, the human rights context or to, to a far lesser extent, and that have also less room in uh, the academic context. So that is what, um, yeah, essentially I see these three contexts as um, essential, really, to to our work and our and as and our work generating different discussions in in each of them. I do get um, you know sometimes criticism um, concerning our work being shown um, in the art context, and you know I think we should always be very careful. Uh, let's say with regard to the question of spectacularization of of suffering, for for example, right? And um, but I I'm I'm also um, very reluctant to in, endorse too easily this uh, critique, simply because I think it's also founded often on a kind of presupposition of the space of art as some kind of space of um, sensorial enjoyment, right? You go to an art exhibition to go and see nice things, right? No, that's such an impoverished understanding of, of, the, of, of arts, right? The art context is in fact really one of the spaces today in which we can think our world beyond the boundaries of various disciplinary knowledge um, formation. So I don't think that violence is less important to show and discuss in the context of art than in any, um, than in any others. But that does not mean that it should not, that showing and discussing uh, th this work should, should not be done with a lot of care. Um, uh, as to, the, you know, the aesthetic politics um, involved. Okay, thank you. In today's panel, Border of the Future, we had this morning, we heard a presentation by Götz Hermann, who was talking about um, the concept of the so-called smart borders. And what would you say, how is artificial intelligence, digital technologies in general, how will they influence migration and migration politics in concerning monitoring, controlling migration? What is your opinion? Well, I mean, if I, if I think of this through the perspective of the sea, there, there are, you know, growing uses of various, you know, algorithmic prediction um, <laughs> methods used to uh, track vessels, determine anomalies uh, in behavior at sea, predict, let's say, zones of uh, border risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is an existing trend, a trend that we're we're looking into um, as uh, as well. And clearly, I'd say that generally, um, this trend towards the technolized technologization of uh, borders is only increasing with uh, the response to the pandemic, right? Increasingly, um, borders, the very border becomes um, our bodies, right? And uh, health and uh, citizenship status are being kind of, you know, combined, conflated in new forms of a very, uh, very dangerous um, policing that, that in fact really risk, I'm thinking now of um, COVID passports, for example. Very simply put, the combination of um, vaccine hoarding by states of the global north that we're seeing right now, and I'm sure you bear in mind the, the debate going on at present at the, the, the level of the, the EU, um, but it's even more important to keep in mind the way uh, the EU as a whole and global, global north, states of the global north, have uh, bought the majority of doses of vaccine at the expense of countries of the global uh, south. So access to the vaccine is entirely unequal. And if you combine that with um, COVID passports that condition uh, international mobility on access to those vaccines, it's very, very easy to see that the, the coming months, possibly the coming years, will in fact see um, 
uh, an exacerbated uh, degree of mobility in equality between the global north and the global south. Saying that again, uh, does it means in no way that I do not take seriously um, the, the pandemic and the, the need to uh, tackle it in the most serious and determined way. Um, but I really believe that the, the response to, to that cannot be, um, uh, you know, nationalism, but actually international uh, solidarity and collaboration. Yeah, and I have one last question because you were talking about safe and legal ways of migration. And so I would like to ask you, what might be solutions to establish a more human humanitarian way of migrations? Might, for instance, humanitarian visas be a solution to find a more yeah, humanitarian way? Humanitarian visas are, are certainly an important tool. We should, we should use it. Um, but it will never be a sufficient tool simply because it will con continue to select amongst migrants who are worthy of those visas and, and migrants who are uh, not. And those who are not will continue to migrate through, um, uh, will continue to be illegalized and migrate using clandestine strategies. So in that sense, I think what many movements and ourselves suggest as the only viable solution, in fact, is a policy that is founded on the free movement of, of all people and gives, gives that freedom um, a legal frame to, to unfold. Um, we're very aware that this is not um, a, a popular uh, pr proposition that uh, many might call it uh, utopian. You know, from my perspective, uh, the last 30 years of policies of border closure demonstrates, on the contrary, how utopian seeking to seal borders and prevent mobility is. If those policies could work, I think after 30 years, we, we would know it. They failed miserably. They only generate further human suffering, um, but also political crisis. I think it's much more effective to start from the fact of human movement. That is the reality. Give a legal frame for that human movement to unfold and really try to tackle the, the broader political, economic conflicts and inequalities that today make migration um, so, so contentious. Um, I think what we need to do is really uh, try to tackle and transform and de-escalate what today is a form of mobility conflict. Um, clearly, the current policy of closure is, is, is very simply a, a dead end. That is a powerful closing statement. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, with Thanks taking, to both of you. Well, thank you so much. It was really, thank you for this highly interesting talk and also for patiently answering all our questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, thank, thanks for sharing with them with me. <laughs> thanks, Charles, and take care. Bye-bye, <laughs> and thanks to all the participants. <laughs>